And you look into scripture, and we see that God puts forgiveness even above justice, and that he is willing to forgive anything. And it just doesn't make sense to the skeptic. That's why they don't even understand Christianity. You know, Sigmund Freud said this. He said, one should forgive one's enemies, but not until after you have hanged them. And you know, that's sort of how our world thinks. We don't think that people should be forgiven. Welcome to Church of the Rock from Winnipeg. Stay tuned to this week's thought-provoking message from Pastor Mark Hughes. So what we've been doing is we've been talking about changing your world through prayer. And we've been looking specifically at the Lord's Prayer. And we found out this, that Jesus' disciples figured out the secret to his success, and it was prayer. That's right. He went from place of prayer to place of prayer and worked miracles in between. And so we've been looking at this amazing model prayer called the Lord's Prayer. And we've been learning several things, like to whom we pray, the Father in heaven, what we pray for, to how we pray. And today we're going to discover the key to unanswered prayer. Unanswered prayer. Anybody ever experienced that? Anybody? Am I the only one? Oh, a bunch of you experienced that. Good. So this will be good for you. So today we're jumping back into the Lord's Prayer. We're in Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to start at verse 9 today. And it says this, In this manner, therefore pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So that's where we're going to stop today. I mean, Jesus has been on a roll. He's telling us how to pray. And I mean, it's been pretty amazing. I mean, he tells us that we can have a personal relationship with God in heaven, the, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Then he tells us that we can invoke the kingdom of heaven to come to earth. He can, tells us that we can access the resources of heaven for earth's needs and that those needs will be met every single day. And then he goes on and tells us that God will forgive all of our debts and then he ruins it by telling us we have to forgive other people. Isn't that what's happened here? Now, just, you know, just so you know, make no mistake about this, these debts that he's going to forgive have nothing to do with your car loan or your mortgage. Just in case you've been praying that way, this is not what it's talking about. These are your moral debts. These are your sins. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Or most of us remember it this way, because it's the old English way of saying this prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's how we prayed all the way through school. But my very favorite version of this line is from the Susie version. Do you know the Susie version? She was a five-year-old that tried to pray this prayer, and it went like this. Forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. <laughs> and let me tell you something about that. I think it's more theologically correct than almost anything. And I think that really, she really got it. She kind of me messed up the words, but she got the essence of it. Is that really what every one of us has in life, if we think about it, is we have a trash basket full of life's garbage. And what we really need to do is allow God to empty that trash basket. But see, here's what we do. I think what we do is we set these things aside. We say, I'm never going to touch that again. And then what we do is we go rooting around the trash basket and pull it out again. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Let me give you the computer analogy. You'll all understand this. You've probably forgotten this, but in the early days of the desktop, they had this little garbage can in the corner, and it was called the trash bin. And here's a picture of it. And it was uh, you know, just up in the corner, and when you had a file you wanted to get rid of, you just sort of dumped it, dragged it over, and put it in the trash. But somewhere along the line, they changed the name of that. Did you notice? What's it called now? Yeah, that's right, it's the recycle bin because we're more environmentally conscious now. And so we're not going to pollute the environment with our deleted files. And so we put them in recycling, not in the trash. But for the most part, it still amounts to the same thing. And here's what happens. When you drag a file over and dump it in the bin, it's gone forever, right? No, see, you're all smart enough to know that it's not gone forever. You can go back there, and it's still in the, in the trash bin. And what you have to do, if you want it to be gone forever, what do you have to do? You have to delete or empty the bin. 
And see, this is what we do. I think it's so true. Is we, we, we have sins in our life. We have things in our life. I don't want to gossip anymore. I don't want to criticize anymore. I don't want to overeat anymore. I don't want to, you know, do, take those pills anymore. We have all these things we don't want to do. And so we say, well, I'm going to set it aside. And I'm never going to touch it again. And then the next thing you know, you're rooting around in that trash bin to pull that thing out. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? And when he says he will forgive you your trespasses or your sins or your moral debts, he's saying, I'm going to empty that bin. I'm going to get rid of that bin and wipe it away and separate your sins as far as the east is from the west. That's a pretty good promise. Jesus says this, when you pray, one of the things you say is forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins. And the scripture tells us, 1 John 1, 9, that if we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and to cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. Did you catch that? All your sins, all your unrighteousness. There is nothing that God will not forgive. Am I right about that? Will he forgive you of lying? Cheating? Stealing? Murder? Even murder? He'll forgive you of murder? Oh, well, you know, it's true. You look into scripture, you find at least two guys that were forgiven of murder. We have King David, he murdered. We got Paul the Apostle, he murdered. And, you know, the world doesn't understand that. Because they don't think, they, they think that, you know, forgiveness goes so far, but then there's a line. And then that justice is more important than anything else. And you look into scripture, and we see that God puts forgiveness even above justice. And that he is willing to forgive anything. And it just doesn't make sense to the skeptic. That's why they don't even understand Christianity. You know, Sigmund Freud said this. He said, one should forgive one's enemies, but not until after you have hanged them. And you know, that's sort of how our world thinks. We don't think that people should be forgiven. And let me explain, it's real simple, but let me explain anyway, the difference between justice and forgiveness. See, justice is getting what you deserve, and forgiveness is not getting what you deserve. There's a big difference, but what we're going to discover today is that forgiveness is actually more powerful than justice. And that's why James tells us this. He says, mercy triumphs over justice. There's really nothing more important powerful in our lives than this thing called forgiveness. Jesus doesn't tell us to pray for justice. He tells us to pray for forgiveness. And there's something about it that we need to get a hold of. And I don't want you to think for a moment that just because it's forgiveness is easy, which it is. All you have to do is ask. That's all you have to do. I don't want you to think just because it's easy, it's cheap. Because it's not cheap. It came at the highest price, more high than anything else in this universe ever. The price that Jesus paid on the cross for your sin is incalculable. We will never comprehend this side of heaven what Jesus paid for your sin to take it away so you could confess it and you could be cleansed and your trash basket could be emptied. And that is why the song that we sing in this church by Michael W. Smith goes like this. I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon the cross. See, all sin of all mankind, past, present, and future, every man, woman, or child that ever lived was on Jesus for those few hours. The price that Jesus paid, we will never truly know and never truly understand. And that's why when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he actually didn't really want to go through with it, did he? He didn't really want it. I mean, he begged God. He said, if it is all, at all possible, take this cup from me, because he knew what he was getting into. And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus went to the cross so you could have this thing called forgiveness. So I think most of us know that, that we need to confess our sin and there's no sin that won't be forgiven. But here's the part many of us don't know, is that when we don't confess our sin, if we have unconfessed lingering sin that we have regarded and kept in our heart, then it affects drastically and dramatically our prayer life. And in fact, it is the number one cause of an unanswered prayer. And I want to show it to you from Scripture because some of you aren't going to believe it unless you see it in black and white. And, and here's where it is. It's in, first one is in Isaiah 59, verse 2. And it says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. Here it is. So that he will not hear. Did you hear that? Our sin prevents him from even hearing our prayers. And unless you think that's a one-off, Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So here's the whole key to this, is that what happens is 
We have this unconfessed sin in our life, almost every one of us, and we don't know why God's not listening to our prayer. And it says, it's not that he won't answer the prayer. It's that he doesn't even hear it. Because what we have done is we have hindered access to heaven through unconfessed sins. He's willingly able to take all your sin away from you, but if you abide it in your heart, if you regard it in your heart, if you hold on to it, if you're digging around in the trash basket and never emptying that, then what happens is God just turns his deaf ear to you. And you know what? As every parent in this room, we should understand this. If you have some kid and he's a real stinker, a real rotter, and he's just, you know, always, you know, giving it and yelling and screaming and, and cursing and misbehaving, and at the same time he's doing all that, asking you to take him out for ice cream, are you taking him out for ice cream? No, not only are you not taking him out for ice cream, you're not even listening to his request. You're not even going to indulge him in answer, are you? Why would you? Until he starts to behave a little better, you're not even going to listen to him. And that's the same thing. He's a father, and, you know, we're going to act a certain way, and we think we can live like a, the devil and then pray for God for all these things. And he says, no, no, I'm not listening to you until you to come to me. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to. It's not a reward for good behavior, but it's a matter of dealing with the bad behavior and bringing it towards me. And God will deal with it. It's a great deal. Best deal of all history. So the first part of this equation is that if we don't confess our sin, then he's not even hearing us. But you know what? We're not done here yet. Because the next part of this, he says, forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Did you catch the proviso that we get our sins forgiven the same way we forgive others? And if you don't think those are two are connected, then I suggest we read the next verses. You know, Jesus goes through the whole Lord's Prayer, and this is the only one item that he reiterates and he explains and expands so that you make no mistake about it. And it's in verse 14 and 15, we'll go there, in, in Matthew 6, and this is what it says. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Did you hear that? That this is a proviso. He's not going to forgive you unless you forgive others. Now, he's the one who starts it, but he says, look, I'm going to forgive you, but you have to extend that same forgiveness to other people. And if you won't do that, then I won't forgive you. Now, you see how it's a problem? If we don't forgive others, then God doesn't forgive us, and if, if we're not forgiven, then he won't hear our prayer. So do you see the problem here? The greatest hindrance to unanswered prayer is, is unconfessed sin and the offenses that we hold towards other people. And compound that with the fact that we live today in the most offended, hypersensitive culture that there ever was. Have you noticed? People are offended about everything. People think it's some sort of badge of honor to hold a grudge or be offended with somebody. And you see people all the time, I'm offended by that remark. You deserve to, I deserve an apology. You need to apologize to me and to everybody else. And everybody's going on and on and on about how they demand an apology. I mean, it's just so ridiculous. And you know, I don't know if you know this about me. I'm sort of outspoken. I, you probably haven't noticed that. And, and as a consequence for that, I get letters and calls every single week from people who are offended. And they're offended, and they're demanding a public apology. Oh, like that's going to happen. If I start giving public apologies every time someone's offended by one of my remarks, I would spend the whole half hour apologizing to people, and then I'd have to apologize to the people who were offended because I shouldn't have apologized for what I shouldn't have apologized for. It's a vicious cycle. And I know every once in a while somebody, I say some things that sort of throws people off a little bit. The Mennonites always think I'm poking fun at them. That's only because I love them. That's why I do it. You know, people don't understand this. You know, I, I was telling this joke the other day. I started this joke and I said, so there was these two Germans walking down the street. Somebody says, whoa, 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 whoa. Pastor Mark, does every one of your jokes always have to have some sort of racial overtones? Why can't it just be two people? walking down the street. Two men. I said, okay, we'll go there. I said, so these two men are walking down the street. Hans and Wolfgang. <laughs> so this is what we're living in, folks. We're living in this, in this culture where people are so offended by this, by that, by the next thing, and uh, as a result, we're not getting where we need to get. And let me explain to you how this works, because the word offense in the Greek 
It's the, the Greek word scandalon, where we get our English word scandalize or scandal, scandal. And it literally means a trap. And if you can imagine a bear trap or an animal trap, and what happens when we get offended with somebody, we are stepping into the trap. And we think we're putting the other person in bondage. I got news for you, you're putting yourself in bondage. And that's what offense does. When we hold offenses towards other people, we're the one who gets punished with it. A lot of times they go merrily on our way, on their way. They don't even know you're, you've got a problem with them. And meanwhile, you're all bent out of shape about something, and you're the one who stepped in the trap. And the worst part of it, and what this message is all about, is that's the big hindrance to prayer. So let me tell you a story about this. So we were doing one of our Tuesday night meetings where we're praying for people and whatnot. And this woman came up, and she asked for prayer, and she says, I've got fibromyalgia. I said, well, what does that look like in you? And she says, I'm in pain from my entire body from the moment I wake up, well, actually all night. I'm in pain 24-7, and I've been in this kind of pain for 10 years. And she says, I just really need some deliverance from this or freedom from this. So I said, I'd be happy to pray for you. So I reached out and I laid my hands on her. And the moment I laid hands on her to pray for her, I had this sense of something. I said, ma'am, I don't want to be presumptuous or anything, but I have this sense that there's maybe some unforgiveness or offense in your heart. Is there anybody you're offended with? Well, she just starts crying. She just starts crying and crying. She says, I told my husband this morning that I was leaving him. And then she started talking about her hatred and her anger and her, and her bitterness towards her husband. And then she says, and not just to him, towards all men. And I'm thinking, I'm a man. You know, that was a, you know I'm pretty smart about stuff like that. And so, and, and, and then she explained to me that what happened when she was nine years old, she got sexually abused for many years by her uncle. And of course, you don't, have to be a psychologist to understand what this does to people. And what it did was it inflicted a wound when she was nine years old and she'd be carrying this wound for all these years against that person, but not only against him, but against other men and, and, and now brought it right into her marriage with her husband. And so I said to her, you know, I'd love to pray for you for your fibromyalgia, but I'll tell you, you have got to get a hold of this thing called bitterness and resentment and you've got to release these people. And you've got to forgive your husband. You've got to forgive your perpetrator. And you've got to forgive all men if that's what your problem is. And she said, I don't know how to do that. And I said, you know what? You just have to ask. If you will confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all. You have to. You forgive them by releasing it to God. That's how you do it. And I said, God will enable you to do this. You can forgive these people. So I led her in this prayer. And I said, you know, you'll have to fight for it every day, but I'll, I'll pray for you, and this will be the start today. And you'll have to, you know, the feelings are going to come back, and you deal with it, and you pray for it again. So anyway, I prayed for her, and then a few minutes later, I asked her how she was feeling. She says, I hurt everywhere. I went, okay, have a nice night. And uh, <laughs> anyway, she calls me the very next day, and she said she woke up that morning, and for the first time in 10 years, she was without pain. Don't miss the connection here to the fact that she was willing to let go of this bitterness she'd been holding on to for so many years. So then I never saw her again, actually, until about a month later. And, I, and when I ran, ran into her, I said, how are you doing? And she was still pain-free. She says, I still struggle with that, with the forgiveness piece. But she says, I realize it's connected. And as long as I can stay in, in forgiveness, I can stay healthy. And so that's a powerful lesson for us to understand what offenses do, that that's a trap we step in. And Ecclesiastes chapter 7 says this, that offenses of the heart are more bitter than death. And I know most of us don't understand that, but I'm telling you it's true. And I want to tell you a little homegrown story. It's a tragic story. You'll all know this story. It happened in 1984 right in our city, and every, every, every Winnipegger knows this story. And it's the story of Candace Dirksen, 13-year-old schoolgirl. Here's a picture of her, unfortunately, one of the most famous pictures in Winnipeg history is this picture of Candace at 13. And uh, she was coming home from school and never came home one day. And she was missing for six and a half weeks. And finally, after six and a half weeks with no sign, I mean, imagine the grief the parents were dealing with for that six and a half weeks. And then they found her in an abandoned shack not far from her home, uh, dead, uh, bound, head, uh, hands and feet. And uh, they were just, it was just such a shock. And, the parents, whom many of you would recognize this name, Cliff and Wilma Dirksen, here's a more recent picture of them, they got this tragic news that their daughter had been found dead that day. That very same night, at 10.30 at night, there was a knock on the door, 
And there was a stranger at that door, and he introduced himself, and he said, I needed to come talk to you because you've just become part of a very exclusive club, a club of people that have had a child murdered. And I just want you to know, and I want to share with you the kinds of things that you can expect to happen over the next few years. And then he went into his tragic story about how this murder of his child had ruined his life and that he can't even remember, he has no memory even of his daughter anymore because all he can think of is the need for vengeance and justice and the hatred in his heart and he had lost his family, his wife, his relationships, his job, his ability to concentrate, his ability to work, he had lost everything. And this is what he shared with them that their future was going to look like. And then he left and they looked at each other and they said, we're not prepared to go down that path. And they made a decision that night, the, the night that their daughter was discovered dead, they made a decision that night that they were going to forgive the murderer. The next day when the reporter showed up, that's exactly what they told him. They told him why they were going to forgive. And they told him they were going. And they became famous right across the country for the, as the couple who forgave. It was an extraordinary thing. And they didn't even know who he was at this point. Of course, th there was no knowledge of that. And of course, they didn't realize how hard it was going to be. It was easy, or it was hard to say it, but it was not nearly as hard as how they had to deal with it every single day. And for 22 years, they faced the pain of that every day for 22 years. And then a man was arrested. And this man in 2007 was tried, and he was found guilty by a jury, and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison for the murdering of Candace Dirksen. Now they had to deal with all of that. They had to go through the trial, and they had to testify. And all of a sudden, all of these feelings were back. And now this man that they had forgiven was a real man. There he was, in person, sitting in the defendant box in the, in the courtroom. And they had to forgive this man who had taken their little girl from them. And they had to get to that place where they had to deal with that. So they got through that, and, and he went to jail. And they thought their chapter was finally closed. But in 2017, the case was... Uh, elevated to a higher court that acquitted him, and this man went free. And he's out on the street today, and all of a sudden now they have to deal with the pain of this once again. 30-some years of processing the pain and forgiveness of this tragedy that happened in their family. And you see, he who forgives sets a prisoner free only to discover that the prisoner was themselves. See, that's the power of forgiveness. And see, and I want to close with this idea, this concept that I live by every day. See, I have a motto on forgiveness, and if you've been around here any length of time, you know it. And this is my determination, my principle of life, that I will forgive everybody all the time. There is nobody I won't forgive. I know enough about this to know how important this is. The consequences are too great. He says, if you won't forgive others, then neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. That's too big of a price for me to pay for you. And so I am going to forgive everybody all the time. I don't care what you do. There's nothing you can do or nothing you can say to me that I won't forgive you for. Now, now don't, don't take that as a personal challenge, all right? <laughs> but I'm telling you, I'm just going to live that way, forgive everybody all the time. I have people, they'll, they'll, they'll call me up and they say, Pastor Mark, remember three years ago I said this to you? I said, no. And they said, well, I just, well whatever, I wanted to apologize for saying it. I say, you know what, if you, if you want to offend me, you're going to have to try a lot harder than that. Because I'm going to forgive everybody all the time. It's just the way I'm going to live. And I want to encourage you to live that same way. Because Jesus talked to Peter about that. Remember with Peter, they were dealing with this, and Peter says, like, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Like, seven? <laughs> he thinks like he's really being generous here. Like, seven times? Jesus says, no, no, not seven, what, what? Seven <laughs> times 70. So that's, let's see, that's 490 times. I'm at 483. I have a few more to go, and I don't have to forgive. No, no, you've missed the point. When he said seven times 70, he's telling us this, that you have to forgive everybody. You got it. How many are you getting? I want you to say, I want you to say it with me. I'm going to forgive everybody. I'm going to forgive everybody. You're starting to get it. All right, I'm going to close with one kind of amusing story where I got tested on this, and I think you're going to like this one. So a few months ago, we're having this pastor's meeting right here at the church. We're in the theater down there. And uh, we're having this meeting, and the subject that particular day is forgiveness. My sweet spot, right? And so we're having this conversation about and praying about forgiveness, and uh, the leader of that meeting says, now this is what we're going to do in this next few minutes. 
we are going to all pray together in groups, and we're going to ask the Lord this single question, Lord, do I have an offense against another human person? I want you to reveal it to me. And so we're going to pray, because I know every one, of you, every one of you has an offense. You have somebody you need to forgive. So we're going to ask the Lord to reveal that person to us. So we're praying in these groups. We're all asking this question. I'm getting nervous for when it comes around to me, because I'm getting nothing. Right? Because I'm thinking to myself, I don't have anybody. I have short accounts. I forgive everybody. How often? All the time. I forgive everybody all the time. So I, I came up with nothing. And so when they said, Mark, do you have someone you have, have to deal with? I said, well, you know, I have lots of problems in life, but this isn't one of them because I forgive everybody all the time. Woohoo! You know, and I'm all, you know, kind of a little self-righteous about this that I have no one that I can think of and the Lord's not revealing it to me, so I'm feeling pretty good. So then immediately after this pastor's gathering, some of the pastors went out for lunch. I went out with them. I ended up at this table with four other guys. So there's five of us at this table. And uh, the menu comes around. It's the lunch menu. And the lunch special is 10 bucks. And so there's several options. So I picked this lunch special. And I was the first one to order. And after I ordered, I turned to these other guys. And I said, by the way, guys, I'm buying. And uh, as soon as I said that, two of the guys put away the lunch menu and pulled out the dinner menu. <laughs> I am not joking. They, pulled, they put it away. I saw them do it. They put down, down the lunch menu, and they've opened up the dinner menu. And I'm thinking, seriously? What's, what just happened here? I offered, to, I offered to pay for lunch, and these guys pull out the dinner menu? Now, I was in a conversation, so I wasn't really paying attention to what they ordered. And then the food came. And there I was. I was sitting with a, my little $10 special. It was a half a sandwich and a half a bowl of soup. And uh, that was my, my $10 lunch special. And these two guys, one on either side of me, you ready for this? They had both ordered the two most expensive things on the menu. The one had the steak and potatoes and all the fixings, and his plate was like this. The guy on the other side of me, he ordered the chicken and the ribs, and his plate was like this. We were having lunch. It was 11.30 in the morning, and he had more food than I could eat in a week. And I'm thinking, what? What did these guys do? And I mean, there was so much food, they could barely eat it. And the one guy sitting there eating his ribs, I can't even talk. He, has to, he barely got through his food. He's eating his food there. And, I'm, and I felt, and then, I'm just being honest with you, and I felt this offense rising up in me. And I think, did these guys just take advantage of the fact that I'm buying lunch? This, how many of you are tracking with me? Is this just me that thinks like this? <laughs> Thank you. A few of you are going, you get this. So this is rising up in my heart like this. And then all of a sudden it dawned on me, this is a test. This is a test. Do I really forgive everybody all the time? Is there really nobody in this world that I have to forgive? Now I have two guys right here <laughs> in front of me that I can practice what I preach. And in that moment I thought, I really need to let this go. And it's not just a matter of forgiving them. It's a matter of finding joy. And then I thought, you know what? I am going to joyfully and generously buy these guys lunch. Never mind that the $50 lunch just turned into $110. I'm thrilled to do it. <laughs> and I really had to release this because I thought, I'm not going to let this offense grab me because it's going to kill me. These guys are happy as clams. I'm the guy who's going to be, be sore about it, right? So by the time I got home and I'm telling Kathy the story, I'm laughing my head off. And I said, I feel like, I feel like the Lord was testing me, and I feel like I passed the test. And then the more I thought about it, here's what dawned on me. I thought, you know, those two guys, they had just been in this building for the very first time. And they saw this $2 million addition that we had put on there. And then I took them out for lunch and offered to buy. In their minds, I got more money than Donald Trump. <laughs> they don't know I'm a cheapskate. How are, they supposed to know? How are they supposed to know that? And so what, instead of being insulted, I should have been complimented that they understood my magnanimous and generous nature and that we will celebrate together this considerable largesse that I live in. That's what was going on in that moment because I learned how to forgive everybody all the time. And if we begin to live like that, I'm telling you, you'll have more answered prayers and you're going to know what to do with it. Let's stand together, shall we? 
If you'd like a booklet to help you understand more about God's gift of forgiveness and reconciliation through Jesus Christ, please contact us and we'd be happy to send you a free copy of the Book of Hope. Visit our website at www.churchoftherock.ca. Thank you for watching and God bless you.